Um, so, hey everybody, uh, like Dan said, my name is Devin Rader and I work for a company called Twilio. I'm a developer evangelist. Uh, and the 30 second explanation of what Twilio is, in case you haven't heard of Twilio before, is we uh, are a communications company and we have an API, a simple REST API, that lets developers send and receive text messages and make and receive voice and voice over IP phone calls from within their apps. So we're gonna spend the next um, 60 or so minutes talking about uh, real-time web messaging with a technology called SignalR. So I assume most of you have at least heard of SignalR, otherwise you, you may not be here. How many of you have actually played with SignalR at all? Uh, awesome. Yes? You sort of? No, only a client. Somebody oh. has a chat Yep. Okay, cool. So cool, this, is, this will be great. Uh, um, hopefully you guys learn a whole bunch about SignalR uh, in the next hour. So the way I kind of like to start is by advancing my next slide. There we are. Uh, to just sort of lay out what a definition for SignalR. Um, SignalR is a high performance, open source, real time, bi-directional communications framework. And that is a lot of uh, large fancy words. And SignalR uh, offers a lot of power. Um, but I think it's important to sort of take that big definition and kind of break out those individual words and talk about them separately uh, to get a better idea of what SignalR is um, and how it, what, what it can do for you in your apps. So let's start by talking about real time. Um, most of us are web developers, I assume, or have done some web developers or some web development. And um, so we have this idea of the web and understand that historically it's um, the model that the web operates in is request response. Right? A client creates a request and sends it to the server and the server sends a response back. And that pair, that request response pair, essentially lives in isolation. Right? The client and the server don't really know anything about any request response pair that happened before and they don't know that any request response pair will happen in the future. Right? That, that pair lives on its own. But there are scenarios where that becomes problematic. Right? There are scenarios where you want the server to kind of know that the client exists, right? Because in the typical model, once that request response um, occurs, the client doesn't know anything about the server anymore, and the server doesn't know anything about the client anymore. They essentially don't know that each other even exists. Um, and so there are scenarios where, where that becomes problematic, where you want to sort of create a persistent connection over HTTP between clients and servers. And that's where SignalR comes in. Um, we have technology, in fact, we have technologies that um, allow you to create this persistent connection between a server and clients. But the problem really is, is that, like I said, we have more than one technology to do this. And if you're dealing with web browsers, individual web browsers implement different technologies, right? So, um, Ajax long polling is one particular way of sort of creating this uh, pseudo persistent connection. Forever frame is another way to do it. Event stream is another way to do it. Uh, WebSockets is kind of this new thing that's come out um, that is another way to do it. But each browser has kind of chosen to implement one of these particular ways of doing it. Um, and then even amongst browser versions, certain browser versions support different mechanisms for creating this persistent connection. And so one of SignalR's, I think, biggest um, benefits is that it abstracts all of that away for you. Right? You don't have to know anything about Forever Frame or Event Stream. You don't have to write separate code paths in order to figure out what browser you're running in and to figure out what its capabilities are. SignalR does all of that for you so that you can just focus on writing um, um, your app. It basically allows you to say, who cares? I don't care what technology you use, I just need a persistent <laughs> connection. I see that. My <laughs> <laughs> Bi-directional. Um, so uh, I think the, the largest problem is pushing from server to client, right? Um, we have technologies, we've had, most people use Ajax um, to go from client to server, and that's a relatively solved problem. So the larger problem is going from um, server to client, but um, 
The, the problem within that is that if you have one technology to push from server to client and a different technology to push from client to server, again, now you're learning two things and you're potentially writing two separate sets of code. And so this is, again, where SignalR comes in. Uh, even though, essentially, it's doing AJAX, call, AJAX callbacks to communicate from the client to the server, or it might be using WebSockets, again, better technology, um, it's all abstracted away from you. Right? So you get one really nice, really consistent, uh, really easy to use API for not only pushing from server to client, but also pushing client to server. So you only have to learn one thing. You just have to learn how to use SignalR, and it really doesn't matter which direction you want these messages to go. Um, it essentially is the same API. And so um, the most common, I think, place that people are going to use this is in browsers, again, because uh, that is the place where this is a very hard problem to solve. Uh, but SignalR also allows you to not just create JavaScript-based clients, but other kinds of clients. So you, there's a client library for, um, for JavaScript. There's a client library for Silverlight. Uh, there's a uh, Windows 8 client library, a Windows Phone client library, and just a, a regular .NET uh, client library. And what's really awesome about the fact that they have client libraries for all of these different platforms, again, comes back to the fact that you learn one thing. Right? You learn the SignalR APIs. And those APIs are essentially the same on all of these different platforms. So if you start out by writing a web app that uses SignalR and is communicating with the server, and then your customer comes back to you and says, we'd love to have a Windows Phone app, or we really need a Windows 8 app, um, one, you're not learning a new set of APIs. It's essentially the same set of APIs across these client libraries. And two, you're not, you don't have to create a different backend. Right? It's the same server backend running, all running on SignalR. Uh, for all of these different platforms. Open source. Uh, how many of you have customers that will let you use open source or bring in open source projects? Depending on the job. Yep, yeah, yeah, and that's really common. Right? Some companies just aren't ready to kind of take that step forward yet for whatever reasons, right? Legal reasons, um, um, support reasons is another really common one. Um, SignalR is open source. It's licensed under an open source license. Um, it is built by Microsoft, but it is licensed under an open source um, license. You can go download the source code if you want from GitHub. Uh, you actually, I believe they take pull requests as well. So if you want to fork it and fix a bug, um, you can work with the team to actually have them accept your pull request. Um, so that's really awesome because we get to go peek under the hood and see what they're doing, right? And tweak it if we need to. Uh, but there are some problems with that. So if you go to GitHub and you fork, uh, that's unsupported, right? You're sort of on your own there. Um, and obviously, if you're building an app for a company, uh, they may not be comfortable with that. So uh, the team at Microsoft also publishes SignalR as a NuGet package. Uh, and this is essentially the officially supported Microsoft version of SignalR. It's no different than if you install Visual Studio. It is a product to them. Um, it has a product life cycle. You can call product support services, or whatever they call it today, and you can say, I'm writing an app, and it's using SignalR, and I've run into a problem, and I would like some help, and they will be more than happy to help you as long as you tell them you installed it through NuGet. Um, so the NuGet install will be more stable, right? So if you go and get pull the source code from GitHub, it literally is whatever they have checked in. They have different branches. Um, so there is a master branch uh, that you can pull down. is sort of their released branch, but they also have kind of their futures branch, what they're currently working on, and whatever they've checked in. Um, so you can sort of do it both ways. But whatever's in NuGet will sort of be the more stable, official release version. Uh, and like I said, it is totally supported. Um, a, a good thing about getting it from Git, uh, GitHub, though, is that if you're doing stuff with Mono, we were just talking about uh, earlier building um, 
apps using the Xamarin tools, right? Mono, Droid, and Mono Touch. Um, they, the SignalR team has gone ahead and added Mono projects, project files, to the GitHub repo. So if you have a customer that says, I would like an iPhone app, and you already have built a back, something that uses SignalR on the back end, um, you can pull the source code from GitHub and compile um, SignalR as a Mono project and use that inside uh, Mono apps if you want. So there are some benefits to doing that. But again, you're sort of living in this unsupported world at that point, so, or at least unsupported from Microsoft. And the last thing is high performance. So SignalR is built to be um, very, very, very high performance. Um, it's built to be a very thin layer uh, so that there's not, it itself does not take a lot of overhead. Um, I have seen some statistics that show upwards of 10,000 simultaneous connections on a single server. Um, so it's meant to be very, very, uh, SignalR itself is meant to be very thin um, and very high performance. So the, the asterisk obviously next to high performance is that since this is one layer in your application, you can't necessarily just look at SignalR and benchmark it and say that's my app's performance, right? I mean, ultimately SignalR is going to be calling or you're gonna have SignalR call into your code, right? So, um, and so you still have to go through your normal benchmarking and testing. Um, the thing that you can uh, to some degree rely upon is that the perf problems likely are not actually going to be in SignalR uh, if you have uh, perf issues, right? Because it's this nice thin layer that's essentially just passing messages back and forth. Uh, if, if you're web farming it, do you have issues to worry about? So we'll talk a little bit at the end about farms and how you scale. Scale up and scale out. All right. So um, that's kind of an explanation of SignalR. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Awesome. So uh, let's jump into a demo. Uh, and this is uh, audience participatory. So I will need your help. Uh, I'll need everybody to get their phones out. Uh, since, since I work for Twilio, I wrote a little demo that um, uses your phone and, and signal arm. All right. So let me jump out of the slides here and go to a couple browsers that I have open. So this is an app that I wrote uh, that's hosted up on Windows Azure websites. And if you can, go ahead and send a text message to that phone number. It's 954-417-7888. Uh, and what's going to happen is uh, as you guys are sending your text messages, please note that we are recording this for posterity. So anything that you text is gonna show up on that screen. So keep it appropriate. <laughs> this is a, well, uh, depends on your plan, right? Depends on your plan. Uh, let me do this as well. Did people send text messages? Oh, there we go. All right. So starting to see a few roll in here, cool. Oh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> uh, so, so the thing to note is that I'm not touching my computer, right? I'm not hitting the F5 key. I'm not refreshing the browser. Um, th these are two different browsers as well. The browser on the left is, uh, excuse me, on the yeah, on the left is Internet Explorer 10. Browser on the right is Chrome, whatever version Chrome is latest. Um, there's no meta refresh in this page, right? So all of these messages are being sent uh, and the page is updating automatically without me having to refresh it or have anything that is actually refreshing the page, right? And so that's actually SignalR doing some of that work. So I can, um, I can go here and I can hit reply on a few of these or all of them. And so now what should happen in a moment um, is your phone should start to ring and buzz. And that's all right, Dan. It's okay. You can answer it. <laughs> uh, and so now you guys should be able to talk to each other because uh, you're all on a conference call together.
Oh, this is wicked cool. <laughs> Hello. And you can say how hey, cool hey, Signal R is. How cool is this? And again, so so the the, the thing to point out um, outside of the, the Twilio part is that um, even though I'm clicking these buttons uh, and people's phones are ringing, that there is no form post going on there, right? Um, again, that's sort of the Signal R part of this, where I'm sending messages back from this client um, and making some things happen. Right. Yep. There. Okay, so let's look um, back in slides for a second and sort of talk about from a really high level what's going on with that demo. All right, so basically what's happening in that demo is you guys are getting your phones out and typing in a text message and hitting send, and that message is leaving your phone and going over your carrier and eventually routing itself to Twilio. Um, so the phone number that you sent that text message to is actually a, a, a Twilio phone number that I purchased. Um, and so that's how your phone and your carrier know where to route that phone number. Right? And so Twilio is going to receive that message. And we get things like, obviously, the body of the message and the number that um, you sent your, your phone number and then the number that um, you sent it to. And the way Twilio works um, is when I buy a phone number from Twilio, I give it a URL. Uh, I can actually give it two URLs. I can give it one for uh, um, incoming SMS messages and one for incoming voice phone calls as well. So whenever Twilio receives an SMS message, it's going to turn around and make an HTTP request to that URL. Right? And so I can write apps that expose URLs, these URLs, and give them to Twilio. And Twilio will essentially notify me each time an SMS comes in by making a request to that URL. And Twilio is actually going to pass along the same metadata to me, the message body and the phone numbers. So that's what I did. I have a web app that's running up in Windows Azure websites that is a MVC application that exposes a URL that Twilio makes a request to. And inside my app that I wrote, uh, there's a couple lines of code in there of Signal R code that essentially know how to um, call a method in every single client that's connected. Right. So in this case, I had two clients connected. I had one client running in IE, and I had one client running in Chrome, and there's some JavaScript running in there. And so the code that's running in, on the server in my web app knows how to actually call those JavaScript methods that are running inside my clients. Okay. And then going back the other way, um, I had buttons on those pages that were added when I got a text message. So when I click that, uh, there's some JavaScript that runs that sends a message through SignalR back up to my web app running in Azure websites. And there's some code in there that knows how to call Twilio's REST API that says, please initiate an outbound phone call to whatever phone number I hand it um, and make that phone ring. Right? And then it goes over your carrier uh, and your phone rings. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and to kind of dig into it, let's actually go ahead and build that because it's not very many. It's not very much code. Yeah. Question. yeah. So from from our client side application, we can initiate a Twilio call, mm -hmm. but somehow we're going to need to make some kind of quest out from my client to the domain called something something Twilio Yep. Right. So how do I get around the cross domain search? Um. So. Well, you're not making the request, in my case, I'm not making the request from uh, JavaScript. Right. Okay, good. So it's server-side right. as well. It's server-side. I got you. So that makes it easier. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good. That, that's, that's normally, not normally, that is one of the workarounds that I've had to encounter. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in my uh, experience. Yeah, we have a way to do things in JavaScript, but in this particular demo, uh, you actually can build a phone in the browser. Um, and so literally, I could I can make a phone call that terminates at my browser, uh, and I can make outbound phone calls right from my browser. But that's sort of outside the scope of SignalR, and I'm happy to chat with you. Nope, it's all right. Good question. Um, all right, so um, let's go over here to Visual Studio. Cool. So this is Visual Studio 2012 update two. Um, it doesn't really matter that much that it's update to. 
Uh, and it's I have sort of pre-primed uh, some stuff here. I've got a, a ASP.NET uh, MVC4 application already created. And I've done a couple of things here um, that I'll show you guys. So I've already gone ahead and added SignalR through NuGet. Right? Uh, and SignalR adds a whole bunch of other kind of dependent libraries. The other thing I've done is I've added uh, Twilio right here. So we have a library that's available through NuGet as well that essentially just wraps our REST API, makes it a little easier to, to consume the REST API. And you can see what happens when I add those things. There's all kinds of ASP.NET stuff that happens um, and gets added. Um, oh, one thing I want to show in here is um, where is it? This assembly, this Microsoft.owen.host.systemweb. Does anybody know what Owen is? So Owen is a, is kind of a cool technology. I'll just talk real briefly about it. Um, so in the scope of Signal R, um, why Owen is there is because Signal R actually uh, can be runs on its own stack, right? So it actually isn't built on like ASP.NET MVC. Um, and why that's interesting is that means you can self-host uh, ASP. or self-host SignalR servers and clients. Right? So if you don't want to have a SignalR server that's running in ASP. or in IIS, you can self-host in whatever kind of server you want, right? So it's a lot like Web API, which also um, uh, offers that same capability. You don't have to run it in IIS if you don't want to. You can come up with your own server. So Owen is is a um, kind of a shim um, that lets me do that. Um, and if you have a chance, go look up Owen. It's it's kind of an interesting. Um, is anybody familiar with Ruby on Rails and Rack? I don't know if you guys are Ruby guys. Um, it's really similar to that, where essentially what Owen does is um, it allows you to have loose couplings between the web server and the web stack, uh, and um, Owen essentially defines a set of uniform interfaces uh, between the web server and the web stack, which in most cases is ASP.NET. Um, but since it's interfaces, anything can implement those interfaces either on the server side or on the web stack side. And so it becomes a lot more interchangeable, unlike today where ASP.NET is essentially um, tied at the hip to IIS. So it's kind of a cool um, technology that, that they're working on. Um, all right, so I added those couple of NuGet packages. The only other thing I've done, well, there's a couple other things I've done. I have a couple of controllers here, home controller, which just loads um, the web page that you guys saw. Are those, sorry, Mr. Yep. Are those interfaces you were talking about, are those going to be native to the next version of I, I don't know. There, there's, a, there's a project called Katana, uh, which is sort of an implementation of the Owen spec that you can go, that is being written by Microsoft, or at least contributed to by Microsoft, that you can go look at. Um, so home controller is basically a default controller. Phone controller is a controller that we'll use to handle the communication to and from Twilio. Right? So when Twilio makes its request, um, phone controller is the endpoint that it will have it hit. And then um, um, uh, when, there's one other thing which I can't remember off the top of my head what we do with it. Uh, right now, it's empty. And then lastly, down here in Global ASAX, I had to add one line. This line right here, route table .routes .map hubs. So, um, oh, let me show you one other thing real quick. So in addition to the assemblies that got added, when I added the SignalR package from NuGet, it also added this JavaScript file. Right. Uh, go away. Um, so the way that SignalR works is um, when I'm using the JavaScript uh, client library, uh, I need to know, I need to have some representation of what's available on the server on the client, right? And so um, SignalR will create a JavaScript proxy 
uh, dynamically for me uh, that I can request in my HTML page, and then I can use that through JavaScript. Right? So that's how you'll see in a minute. That's how I know what methods are available on the server, and that's how the server knows what methods it can call on the client. Um, well, so the way that, that that proxy gets created is I have to request, I have to make a request to the server, um, and that means that in MVC, I need to create an endpoint to make that request to, and that's what's going on here. Essentially, uh, this method looks and finds um, anything that's derived from hub, which we'll create in a second, and um, it knows that that then is a signal, R. it knows it needs to include that in this little proxy object that it's gonna create. Right? You're using Owen to host your endpoint someplace. So Owen is sort of under the covers. Um, Owen essentially you can think of as the thing that allows me to self-host this if I want to. But sort of above, above Owen, everything else is straightforward, ASP.NET, just as you always would use it, right? So really Owen is only sort of interesting in that self-host case. This is literally um, no different than me going in and adding my own route to the route table in MVC by default. Right? It's just that it's doing some reflection to figure out what it needs to add. All right, so let's go add a little bit of code here. Uh, the first thing I want to do is create my hub. And so I, I added this little hubs folder here. I don't have to use a hubs folder. It's, I add that just to keep it my project kind of nice and clean. And I'm going to go ahead and add a signal R hub class. And we'll call it message. And then I'm going to promptly go and replace everything that's in here. And that's it. That's my SignalR server right, to start with. I don't need anything else. I now have a hub created. So um, like I said, you can think of the hub as sort of the thing on the server that allows the client to know what it can call. Um, so when it creates the proxy, by default, it, it takes the um, class name and uh, makes that the name of the proxy object on the client. Uh, however, if I want to, I can use the hub name attribute uh, if I want to change the name to something that's maybe a little more friendly on the client side. Right. We'll just leave it as message for now. And the next thing I need to do is go add some stuff to <coughs> my HTML, which in this case is just an MVC view. This guy called index, and we'll add this chunk of code here. Okay, so if you're familiar with MVC, this should look pretty straightforward to you. It's a script section, uh, which lets me inject scripts into the right place into the page uh, when the page gets rendered. Um, and there's a couple things going on here. The first thing is you'll see that I've added that JavaScript library that signal or that NuGet added to my project. This is uh, essentially the core parts of the SignalR client side library. Right? This is all the infrastructure that SignalR needs in order to know how to connect, create this persistent connection between my client and my server to figure out what the capabilities of the client are, to figure out what the capabilities of the server are, because different servers have different capabilities. All of that stuff uh, is in here. This second script reference is this call to uh, SignalR running on my server in order to get that proxy object. Right? So this is the endpoint that was added uh, when I mapped the route in the global ASAX. Right? And so by calling this, that's going to send back this proxy object to me uh, that I use to then manipulate and call methods. And then the last bit down here is, um, this is just a jQuery you know, document ready function. And inside there, the first thing I'm going to do is turn on logging on my hub, because it makes it a little easier for me to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, and then I call start. 
So calling start actually is what kicks off the process of SignalR going out and figuring out how do I create this connection between the client and the server. So let me go ahead and build this. And I'm going to close these two windows. And we'll go ahead and run this. And so this is Chrome again. And let's see, let's just go ahead and maximize this window for the moment. All right, so um, that page, that view loaded in Chrome. And so I have the Chrome tools open to the console window. And you can see um, what's going on with SignalR here, right? The first thing that's happening is it made a request to SignalR slash negotiate. And this is a request that SignalR uses to figure out what the server is capable of doing, right? Because um, it's mostly around WebSockets. Not every server supports WebSockets. Um, so SignalR has to figure out, hey, I know I can do this. What can you do? And let's negotiate together to figure out how we connect together. So the result of that is um, it was able to, to try and create a WebSocket connection. And that's because, um, and if you go back, to, actually, I should have shown it earlier, but if uh, in the earlier demo, I wasn't actually able to create a WebSocket connection because Windows Azure Websites doesn't support the ability to create a WebSocket connection. Both my clients do, IE and Chrome does, but in that case, the server didn't. So in that case, if we had seen the logging, you would have seen Chrome connecting through Event Stream and IE connecting through Forever Frame. But in this case, because I'm running on my local IS server, which is Windows 8, so it's running IS 8, uh, IS8 Express, uh, it knows how to support WebSockets, and so I'm able to actually open up a WebSocket connection. And then SignalR is telling me, I'm gonna go ahead and keep that alive for a certain period of time. Uh, um, it's not gonna keep it open forever. It will eventually terminate that connection. The good thing is, is that SignalR will automatically try and reconnect immediately um, once that connection gets dropped. But that's it. So I now have an app that essentially has created this persistent connection between the client and the server, and I can start doing more interesting things. So let's go ahead and add a little bit more code here. All right. Okay. So I added a little bit more client code uh, to my view. This line here is basically getting a reference to my hub, right? Remember my hub on the server is named message and I said when I get this proxy object back, it's just gonna get the class name and create the proxy class or proxy object out of that. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm asking the connection to give me a reference to the proxy version of my message hub. Is it game okay to decide? It does automatically does automatically. And then, um, so remember, the first thing that I want to have happen is when somebody sends me a text message, I need to be able to show that on my web page. And I said I need a method that the server can call to do that. And so that's what's happening here. I'm basically registering a, a, a client-side method with SignalR that the server-side part of SignalR will know how to call. Right? And I do that by saying, um, message hub in this case or hub.client so client is an object that is hung off of the hub that lets me register arbitrary methods on the client that the server can call right does that make sense so in this case I created a method just arbitrary method name called add message I could name that whatever I want it's just completely arbitrary and I said all right well when somebody calls add, when when the server calls add message run this function and in this case, I'm basically just adding a button and appending a chunk of code to an unordered list. So that's the client-side code, all 
two, really two lines of it, three maybe. On the server side, um, we are going to go to phone controller and add, oops, and add some code. Okay, so remember I said phone controller is going to be the controller that deals with communicating with Twilio. Um, and so all I've done here is added an action method that um, is the endpoint that Twilio is going to request. And um, I'm, it, again, it will send along the number that uh, sent the text message and then the body of the text message, which this is just MVC uh, model bindings, nothing fancy going on there. But inside this method is a couple of lines that are interesting. So the first thing I do uh, again, what I want to be able to do is somebody sends a text message, Twilio makes that request, I need to be able to, know, to, to call the method on the client, and that's what's happening here. So in order to do that, I use this global host object to get a hub context. Right? So all of this is happening on my server, but I need, a I need some kind of reference to this hub that I created in my project, and that's how I get this. So I call get hub context and pass in the name of the hub that I want the context of, and once I have that context, uh, I can start um, calling methods on the clients that are connected. So in this case, again, I'm doing context.clients.all, um, which would be every client that's connected to this hub, call the add message method and pass in the parameters. And that's it. So really two lines of server code. And um, uh, yeah, that's it. All right. So now let's run this. And I'm going to go ahead and make these windows a little bit smaller so we can see. All right, so over here, I want to, I'm going to fake Twilio making this request. Um, we're going to call phone receive message, right? So this is, in theory, the URL that Twilio would call when it got an SMS. And there you go. Okay. And I'm not sure why it's adding a null. That's new in this demo. <laughs> but yeah, you can see, it's very fast, right? I mean, even though I'm running uh, on my local machine, right? Like, really, you're going to be um, subject to whatever network latency, and that's about it. Right? Um, and I wrote how many lines of code? Again, maybe 10 lines of code total to do bidirectional communication. It's pretty cool, it's pretty easy, it's pretty powerful. Um, and it's just re real, real simple. Any questions at this point? Yeah, how, how does that um, the client uh, hold the, the old method call different from the connection of broadcast? Oh. Uh, so, We'll talk in a little bit about the, the different ways that you can broadcast message or you know sort of bulk call um, functions on the client, right? Because there are a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Um, this particular way is just saying everybody, anybody that's connected to me, right? But you can you can um, be more selective um, in how you do that. What about configuration? What about configuration? Um, I don't believe so. Um, th I mean, there are ways that you can, um, nothing, nothing web config configuration. no, that's it. What you saw, it's, I mean, Microsoft has definitely made this move of convention over configuration, 
right? Like that's that's the way that a lot of the teams are moving. Um, and so that's what this is. This is very convention based as opposed to configuration, right? Um, I mean, there's just not a whole lot to configure, right? Uh, you can configure this URL um, if for some reason you don't want this to be the URL that you that that calls to get the proxy object. Um, there are um, there are overrides on the hub. Uh, let's see, where's my hub? Uh, there are some overrides here for. Uh, sorry. Uh, for things like on connected, on disconnected, on reconnected, right? So you can you can sort of inject some code. Say you want to do something every time a client connects, um, you can do that here, uh, or disconnects, right? You want to you want to note that in the database or something like that, so that you can force some workflow to happen when they disconnect, kind of thing. Um, but I, I mean, it's just it's so simple. <laughs> There's not a lot to configure. Um, on the server, none. No differences. No differences. Okay. Right. The server still has a hub. Uh, the client API is going to be slightly different, obviously, because it's not JavaScript, but it's actually going to be surprisingly very similar uh, because of dynamic. Um, so, do you, do you know the dynamic keyword? Yeah. Uh, so the dynamic keyword. So in JavaScript. Right, one of the advantages of JavaScript is that um, uh, it uses duct typing, right? It's not strongly typed. So you can essentially tack on arbitrary properties and methods to any object anywhere at any time, um, which is one of the things that makes it really powerful, but also makes it um, hard to debug and challenging in other ways. So the dynamic keyword, which was added in uh, C Sharp Four, four, something like that. Um, essentially, brings some of that dynamic capability uh, to .NET itself, to where you can create objects that you can sort of arbitrarily add properties to. Um, you can do some really, really cool things with dynamic. So, uh, and they're leveraging that in in some of the client side frameworks. You said the client can uh, project. So that's, that's, that's yeah, uh, that will be, let me check. This is all completely dependent oh, on how yeah. I write the service. Yeah. yeah. So the demo thus far has basically been the part where you send a text message and I show it on the screen. Yeah. Right. So let's do the other half, which is let me click the button and, and make your phone ring. So I'm going to take this little bit of JavaScript code and add it to my view here. So this is just a JavaScript function called send reply message. And you'll notice that in the button that I added earlier, I already have the click handler being wired up to call send reply message, right? And inside send reply message, is this reference to my hub, right? Which I captured earlier and turned into a global variable. And so there, I'm saying hub.server. So like client is this object that lets you, that essentially tracks all of the client side functions that I want the server to be able to call. The server object is the client side object that, let, that exposes out all of the methods that are exposed on my hub on the server. <coughs> So what I need to do is I need to go add a method in my hub called reply to message, which I will do right here. And so we'll go to my hub, add that in, and fix this. So the fact that this function is in, or this method is inside of my hub means that it will get uh, included in the proxy representation that gets sent down to the client, right? And that means that the client can call this. 
Uh, and inside this, you can see all I'm doing is saying, hey, initiate an outbound phone call. So let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll build this. Okay, now if I hit reply, what should happen is in a second, my phone should ring, because that's my phone number that I sent down with that message. Maybe. Oh, there you go. So when I click this button, let me flip back over to Visual Studio. When I click that button, this client-side JavaScript function is getting called, which tells SignalR, hey, call this server-side method. And in that server-side method is a call to the Twilio REST API. Right? So again, that was, for all intents and purposes, one line of code to do that. Right? Um, so the arguments here are just JSON arguments. Right? So when um, when I call add message, uh, things will get JSON serialized and passed over the wire. So if I wanted to, to send something that was more complex than a string, I could totally do that. If I had a complex object on my server that I wanted to send down, SignalR would just JSON serialize that and send it down as an argument to the client. So anything that's JSON serializable. Same thing here. Um, I actually can send complex things back and it will, um, I think it actually comes back as a dynamic object. Um, I don't know if it'll do like uh, model binding on those, but maybe it will. It might actually. I never got to across the wire. All it was doing was serializing. So it's sending it over the wire as JSON. Oh, okay. And then on the server side, <laughs> it may actually be doing model binding. I actually forget. Well, you can roll your own. You can. You can roll your own model binders. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that's it. Now bidirectional communication in a total of maybe 10 to 15 lines of code. All right. Um, so that's how I built that demo. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Thank you. Uh, no, because I mean, in the end, um, if it has to, it will default to Ajax long polling, which, as far as I know, you know, uh, as long as it's you know, you may if you may have to go back to IIS like four or something like that for something that doesn't support that. So the, uh, I just was looking up your web socket. You mentioned that a couple of times. It came in version four or five of the framework, I think. According to this I just did a quick Google. Yep. I was doing uh, T sixty bindings in WCF using cell motion yep. to do this and it wasn't ten lines of code. <laughs> exactly. It was a lot of lines of code. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, IIS eight natively supports web sockets. Uh, all right, so targeting recipients. So what we saw, like I said earlier, is that um, I basically was broadcasting out to all connected clients, but you don't have to do that. You can be selective in who you want to send messages to. So sometimes you want to only send messages to a group and exclude certain people, right? Uh, sometimes you want to only send message to a, an individual connection, and you can do that. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can choose to send messages through SignalR. And so this is the, the examples of the API that gets in, uh, is on the server side. You can do send all, which we did. Others all accept the caller, which is really cool. So when it, in that example, it would be if client X makes a request to me, I can respond to that specific caller, right? Um, to groups, we'll look at groups in a second. So it's really trivial to, trivial to create groups. Uh, and then you can do things like others in group. So basically anybody but myself. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Uh, so let's look at a demo of that quickly. So I'm gonna 
take my demo here, if I can find my mouse pointer, and uh, come down here. We're going to add a little bit of HTML. Yep, thank you. To my view. Right here. So this is just um, an input button, or sorry, an input field and a button and then a span below there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow uh, the person who loads that web page to specify what group they belong to. And then here's the client side code that goes with that HTML. Uh, so quickly looking at this this code, um, this is the click handler for the button that I just added, and all it's going to do is it's going to call a, a server side method called join, which is just a method that I will make here in a second, uh, and pass a name. Right. And so the last thing I need to do is go create this join method in my hub. Okay. Um, so in my particular, this is demo code, obviously. Uh, I'm essentially letting somebody pass in their own group name. Probably aren't going to want to do that in your apps. Uh, in a real app, what you would do is have something like join that passes in like a username and password, or you could use their connection ID, some sort of unique identifying information, which you would then hustle off to a database somewhere or something like that and say, ah, I know who you are. You belong to this group, right? So that's you put all that logic right here. And then you just call groups.add. So this is signal our API again here. Um, and you're basically saying add this particular connection ID, whoever is calling this method, add them to whatever group name uh, you want. And signal is really ni nice and smart. If that group doesn't exist, it will create it for you. If it does exist, it will just add that connection ID to the list of other connection IDs in that group. So we can run this now. All right. Let's go ahead and close this and close this. So bear with me here for a second while I move some windows around. Because that and this guy like that and should we try and fit one more I'd like to do three like that all right so we're gonna make this guy a member of group a and this guy a member of group A, and then this guy a member of group B. So remember what's happening here is there's JavaScript code that's making a request to my join method, and then my join method is essentially saying, here, you're a member of this group. So now if I go over here and I, oh, I forgot to do that, hold on. I need one more piece of code, I think. Yes. So instead of, um, in my phone controller, instead of calling receive message, I need a way to broadcast to, or to um, restrict to a specific group. Right. So I just created a new action method called receive group message and still good in here. Code should look really familiar, getting the hub context. But now instead of calling clients.all, I'm calling clients.group with a group name and then calling add message for the clients in that group. Uh, we'll go ahead and build this. 
get our windows back here. All right. So I'm going to send a message to group A, and hopefully it'll work. Actually, let me join these again, just to be safe. Oh, okay, cool. So there you go. You said in group A, here's, you said member of group A, but if I scroll down here in B, you didn't say anything. So if I go up here and I change this to who for group B, now, uh, how do we do that? Oh, body. There we go. Now, group, group B gets foo, and nobody else does. Right? So, that's how you can create groups really, really easy. Like, two lines of code. Does it support group hierarchies? It does not support group hierarchies that I know of. Um, yeah, you could yeah, certainly build role. that yourself, it's, right? Because you're you're essentially creating these groups on the on your, you know, yeah. you would have to sort of add that layer of hierarchy yeah. on top. Yeah, I was thinking, let's say, you joined server A slash group B, yep. and your admin wanted to send something to everybody on server A. Yeah, I mean, you could get or pretty complex with this, like but you have to build your own. So. Very <laughs> All right. State. Um, so hubs can keep arbitrary state values, and they do. Um, they they are persisted for the life of the connection, which can be really handy. Um, and both the client and the server can define arbitrary state properties, which is kind of cool. Um, there is one caveat: uh, properties do have to be created after the hub starts. So when I was doing this demo, my original thought was to use the on connected override to create new state properties uh, but there's a bug in signal R that I don't, I don't I still think they haven't fixed uh, where you can't actually create state properties that early you have to do it after that and so that ends up uh, in, in this demo anyway uh, I have to do some tricks to sort of get the hub started and then go create some state properties and then let the server know about the state properties and then so uh, but let's look at a demo of what I have to do. Okay. So the first thing I have to do is I have a um, server-side method that'll go in my hub called setUpState. And so this caller object uh, represents the connection and I'm just adding arbitrary, this is where dynamic comes in on the server-side. I'm basically adding completely arbitrary properties to the caller object. Like there is no underlying caller model that I've created that has these properties. Um, I just completely made them up and added them right here and gave them values. And then uh, I'm adding this setup complete method as well. So now what I need to do is go add a little bit of client side code here, my index. And I'm actually going to replace, I'm going to replace the call to start with a little bit more complex one. So I'm still calling start, but this is something called promises. If you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, promises is kind of a new th thing uh, that I still don't totally understand, but I know this is a promise. Um, so what's going to happen here is we're going to call start. And then once start completes, it's going to call done, which has this function associated with it. You can also call fail. Um, so everything in SignalR on the client side library, you can always add done and fail to. Right? So if I wanted to, to know if my call to um, reply to message failed for whatever reason, servers down, something like that, I can actually add uh, dot fail to the end of that and give it a function that it'll uh, run if for some reason that call fails. Isn't the promise basically a callback? Kind of. That's, that's sort of the way I, 
I don't I don't know if that's too naive of a, a view, but Maybe that's what it's five. It, it, looks, <laughs> it looks really similar to what's been on the screen and on yeah, yeah. Like the for Yeah. Um so if the hub is able to start successfully, then I'm going to immediately call this my setup state method, right? Because like I said, I can't do it in on connected. I have to wait until I'm connected and then go set up those state properties. And then the last thing I have to do, so once the state properties on the server are set up, I want my client to know about them and I want to get the values back out of them. So I will add um, to my client a new function called setup complete. Remember, if I go back to my hub, the last thing that happens in setup state is I call setup complete. So setup complete is now right here. Right? It's a function that I've defined on the client. And in there, uh, I'm just basically uh, changing some stuff on my in the DOM. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about security. Uh, I, I say this in every slide that I talk about security, and you can attest I said the same thing in my web API. Please turn on SSL. Go buy a nine dollar certificate from Namecheap, and put SSL on. Like, just do it. There's no reason not to. Zero reason not to it will increase the level of security in your app basically for free. Um, so securing your app, turn on uh, transport layer security, SSL. Um, the authorized att attribute, if you're familiar with MVC, uh, they have the equivalent of the authorized attribute in SignalR as well. So I can put the authorized attribute either on an entire hub, and any call to that hub will require some kind of authentication. Uh, or I can put it on individual um, methods in my hub. Or if I have multiple hubs, I can essentially uh, can go down here to global host and say require authentication, and that will apply to every hub and every hub method in my entire app. It will require uh, authentication. So. Questions about that? Uh, all right. Um, this is an area where using the fail handler, if I go back over here to my view, is handy. Where's my snippets? Right here. If I go back to my HTML page here, and again, just add a little bit more code. So here I'm saying, when it's done, try this. Otherwise, if it failed, then just pop up a JavaScript alert. Right? So if I put the authorized attribute on my hub and just try this request, I'll get that JavaScript alert that basically says, you're not authorized because you haven't authorized yourself. Uh, by default, I think this works with forms auth. It's basically the equivalent of the MVC authorization tag. So. All right. Let's talk about scaling, and this will be the last thing. Scaling uh, up and scaling out. Um, so by default, SignalR uh, runs on a single node, um, and you can scale that up uh, by adjusting a couple of properties in IIS and in ASP.NET. So by default, IIS limits the number of concurrent requests to 5,000, so you can increase that number uh, to gain some scale up. Same thing with ASP.NET, uh, its number of concurrent requests per CPU is 5,000, so you can change that number to scale up. Eventually you will, hopefully, if your app is nice and successful, you will also need to scale out and add additional nodes. Um, so SignalR by itself is designed to run on a signal, uh, single node, but um, it does support the notion of a backplane, which is what, if you want to scale out over multiple nodes, you'll need to use, basically some backing store 
that can manage um, um, the state data that, that SignalR needs to maintain in order to um, function across multiple nodes. Um, so to use a backplane, you just go here to globalhost.dependencyresolver.use and whatever your backplane is. So there are three backplanes. Um, I don't know that any of them are actually completely released yet. They're all still like in beta. But there's a backplane for SQL Server, there's a backplane for Azure Service Bus, and there's a backplane for Mongo, I might, I think. I think so. Um, and so the SDKs that come with those backplanes, essentially you go and add NuGet packages for whichever backplane you want to use, and that will have an extension method included with it that implements all of the interfaces, and that extension method just goes here. Right. So it would be use SQL Server if you had uh, added the S SQL Server backplane to your project. Uh, and that's all you need to do. There's nothing else from a SignalR standpoint. You just use that. Oh, Redis. I'm sorry. I have them listed there. Redis, SQL, and Service Bus. So this is your question about farms. This is how you address that problem. Uh, and like I said, um, you still need to do perf testing. Um, the SignalR wiki has a nice uh, long list of the recommended performance counters to be looking at when you're doing performance testing. Uh, and then they also have something called Crank, which you can is in the GitHub repository. You have to pull the source code and build it yourself. But Crank is a load testing tool that they built that will simulate um, large numbers of connections to your server, so you can do some level of perf testing. Um, there's another tool called Flywheel, which is um, it's less about load testing and sort of more about uh, like um, UI testing kind of stuff. So, questions on scaling? Okay. So, your homework, go read. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of information. The SignalR website, uh, Microsoft, since SignalR went 1.0, uh, which actually was very recent, they've added some content to uh, ASP.NET, the ASP.NET website uh, that sort of walks you through some of the intro stuff. Um, this, this URL here, ASP.NET slash SignalR. The SignalR, uh, the wiki in GitHub still has lots of information. The problem is that some of it's they're, they're as good at documentation as every developer is good at documentation. So some of it is a little old and hasn't necessarily been updated yet, uh, so you kind of have to watch what you pick and choose. Um, Jabber, how many of you heard of Jabber? Yeah, so Jabber is a website that the SignalR team built that uses SignalR, it's a chat app, um, that's built using SignalR, that's open source, so you can go look at it, um, but they hang out up there a lot, and they actually are really, really super helpful. So you can go into the SignalR room in Jabber and ask David Fowler, who's basically one of the two guys that wrote SignalR questions, and they're, they're usually really, really helpful. Um, so I, I've done that before. So. And that's it. Uh, I'd love to have your questions, comments, feedback. Uh, again, you can hit me up on the web. All my contact info is at that URL, or you can send me a text message, uh, and you'll get a link to that URL. Um, and uh, I'd love to, to get your, your comments and your feedback. So thanks for coming out, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.